Good evening. Well, Y'all don't sound excited to be here. We've been waiting decades for this occasion. Good evening. I see a lot of alums here. My heart is warm. Um, I just want to give a few housekeeping notes. I wouldn't be me if I didn't do that. We're trying to keep the aisles open, if we can, in this middle aisle, as much as you can avoid once we start, because we're filming this. This is going into a time capsule. So that years from now, when the twins go to seminary, we can open up the time capsule, right? Welcome to ATS Presents where we're having a conversation and not a debate. <laughs> I've had the opportunity to be mentored and work with some amazing Pulitzer Prize winners, likes of Colin Powell, historians, the likes. But not, not any time in my life have I had a group of men collectively affect me like this outside of my own family. Mm -hmm. Dr. Robertson, Dr. Shellru, Dr. DeCaro collectively have 68 years of teaching. This is collectively, not individually. <laughs> Between the three of them, there's 68 years of affecting lives. And when I did the math with just the graduating class, and that's not just here. They each taught outside of this place, throughout the world, when we include Dr. Shellru in Manila and other places. But if I did the math with just the graduating classes that go back as far as they began, we're talking about close to 10 to 15,000 students that have been affected by the, these men, which could equate to about hundreds of ministries around the world. People who are preaching and teaching and changing lives because they have been fed into by these three men. I'm being a little selfish because I don't know if I'll ever be able to do this again. I woke up this morning in tears thinking about this. My personal experience, the way that these three men have taught me because I'm a proud alumnus of Alliance Theological Seminary New York City campus. I've been at 361 Broadway, 17 Battery Place, and now in this building when it was still construction going on. But the way that they have taught me has affected the way I teach, the way I preach, and the way they care for me personally, every time they come in this building, they stop at my office just to see if I'm okay. And if I could just talk about Dr. Sherwood for one second, this man is really funny, y'all. He has told me some jokes where I've literally had to spit water out my mouth because it was so funny. So don't sleep on Dr. Sherwood. But the flowers that you see, gentlemen, to your right are from my heart to you. <laughs> One of you have to take a portion of that and give them to your wives because they too have allowed you to be here to minister to us and we don't take that lightly. I'm in appreciation of that. So without further ado, I'm going to pray. I want to say thank you. Um, I, I, I'm not going to cry because I cried all morning. I was praying about this event and I was just in awe remembering how each one of you have, have affected me. Um, it's no small thing. I can share personal things, like literally, that they have either prayed or spoke into my life and talked me off the ledge of this building. <laughs> but I love you genuinely, and I appreciate you. So without further ado, Father God, in the name of Jesus, we submit to you tonight these three men. We thank you that they've been in our lives teaching us, God, how to rightly divide your word and how to reach back into history, both hermeneutically and exegetically sound, God, knowing that you are not a God that does not use history and culture to continue your relationship with mankind. So for that, we say thank you. God, I speak into their lives. I speak into their families that you will continue to bless them and keep them. Let them overflow with love and appreciation from this day forward, God. I don't think anyone who's graduated here can say enough how they've impacted our lives. So, God, if we can just say thank you corporately, God, we lift up our hands and we honor you and we just applaud you, God, that you saw fit to gift them to us. So, God, as they move forward, because there's still more words to teach, there's still more Greek to teach, there's still more Hebrew to teach, there's still more history to teach, there's still more theology to teach in these men. So strengthen them for the journey. When there's been times that they wanted to give up, God, I thank you that they did not turn away. I thank you, God, that even as they preach and they do things outside of this place to affect lives, God, that 
those lives will continue to impact other lives and other lives will impact other lives and it will be a domino effect in the kingdom for your glory and your glory alone. And it is in Jesus' name that we submit this conversation tonight to you. Amen. Amen. Uh, good evening, everyone. Everyone. Uh, first time, I'm pretty excited about this night. I don't yes. know about you all. <laughs> I've been waiting for this uh, since last semester. Yes. We've so been I'm waiting really longer. <laughs> <laughs> um, so as we all know, we have three of the finest professors here from this school. Uh, from your right, we have Dr. DeCaro, uh, who's a professor of history and theology at ATS. He's a strict five-point Calvinist, who's also a Christian determinist. So he doesn't believe in free will. Uh, in the middle is Dr. Robertson. Uh, Dr. Robertson is the professor of Hebrew and Old Testament. And sorry, uh, Dr. Robertson, I'm not entirely sure where you stand. Um, but I do know, I do know that you simultaneously affirm human free will. Uh, but you also acknowledge that God does interact with humans in such a manner. Uh, where their wills are limited. <laughs> and finally to the uh, left is Dr. Shelrood. Uh, he's a professor of Greek and New Testament. Uh, Dr. Shelrood is an Arminian, but he has his own distinct uh, Shelroodian flavor of oh, Arminianism. Yeah. Uh, so maybe if we have time, uh, he can clarify how his Arminianism is different or similar to classical Arminianism. Anyway, let's just give him a round of applause. Yeah. You know, so as a Christian and as, and as a seminary student, I've wrestled with this question for uh, quite a while. Right? I think we all have. Because um, I believe this discussion not only has huge impacts on theology, but also on how we live our lives um, and how we worship God. You know, so some of the you know, first uh, really obvious questions we have in mind is, you know, how does determinism and free will play into salvation? Uh, if we truly have no free will, as the Calvinists believe, uh, then whether we go to heaven or hell is entirely not up to us. Uh, the rest of our eternal lives have been, has been, as uh, Sheldon loves to say, choreographed uh, from the beginning. Uh, the moment certain infants come out of the womb, uh, they have already been sentenced to eternal suffering because God has already predestined their lives uh, to not be receptive to the gospel. An obvious question is, well, is this fair? Uh, is this just? Now, the common Calvinist response is, well, you know, no one's worthy to be saved. Uh, we all deserve to be damned anyway, so the fact that God has saved us uh, demonstrates his grace. But one question I've always been wondering is this. If God truly does operate off of Calvin's framework, and I am in heaven rejoicing that God has saved me uh, and has exercised his judgment against the wicked, will I also rejoice knowing that perhaps my mother or father are suffering eternally because God has scripted their lives in such a manner in which they were never meant to be saved in the first place? Will I be staring at my own parents and rejoice uh, that they quote unquote deserve this eternal punishment? The second question I've always uh, wondered is how does God's sovereignty uh, play in regards to the tragedies of everyday life? Uh, Calvinists believe in a truly sovereign God who's in control of all events, uh, down to even the subatomic particles. Uh, there is nothing in the world that is not in God's absolute control. Uh, this means that certainly all blessings come from God. Amen. Uh, but likewise, all tragedies. It's the same God who allowed us all here to arrive safely. Uh, but it's also the same God who orchestrated disasters in Puerto Rico and Mexico. It's likewise the same God who orchestrates uh, mass genocides and murders. Uh, however, in classical Arminianism, God is spoken of as uh, allowing these tragedies to happen. Uh, so whereas Calvinism says that God orchestrates uh, disaster, destruction, and death, uh, the Armenians are not left off the hook either, uh, since any one of us would ask, well, why did God allow these tragedies to happen in the first place? Uh, finally, is God's sovereignty. Uh, is God's sovereignty limited because he has given us libertarian free will? God is not in direct control of the world in an Armenian, frame, in an Armenian framework uh, because God must respect the gift of free will that he's given us. Uh, if that is true, then on a more personal level, uh, what do we make of prayer? Uh, can we truly pray for change or revival, knowing that God cannot manipulate events or people 
to act in a certain way. If God is not in total control, what do we even pray for? Uh, can we pray for God's spirit to work in someone's life so that they'll see the truth of the gospel? Uh, if we do pray for that, are we not asking God to manipulate an individual's free will? Uh, so what does it mean to pray uh, in light of our libertarian free will? Uh, so hopefully I've whetted your appetites uh, to just how difficult and important this conversation really is. Um, but before we begin, uh, let me just remind you all that, uh, as Kansas has said, uh, that this is a discussion and not a debate. Uh, the professors aren't here to try to proselytize each other and show that they're correct while the other isn't. Uh, we have to remember that Calvinism and Arminianism are both considered orthodoxy. Uh, the goal of this night is to have a discussion so that if we are Arminian, we can understand a Calvinist's point of view without caricaturizing them, and vice versa. Uh, so tonight we'll begin the night with uh, giving each professor 10 minutes uh, for their opening statements, followed by five minutes uh, for a Q&A from the other panelists. Uh, following that, we'll have some sort of uh, free format conversation between the panelists for about 15 minutes. Uh, I've included index cards for everyone if they have any questions uh, they would like to write down. Uh, after that free format uh, for 15 minutes, uh, we'll give you all a five minute break so you can use the restroom, uh, grab more coffee. And during that five minute uh, period, if you'd like, you can uh, bring the questions up to me here uh, and I'll go through them. And for the last hour of the night, uh, we'll be going through those questions, okay? So with that said, let's hear from our wonderful professors. And we hope, Brandon, that you make good use of that bell over there. <laughs> He's the timekeeper. Okay, in my judgment, the key question uh, in all of this is how God has decided to structure reality. Uh, Calvinists are monists in that they believe that God has structured reality by scripting and choreographing every detail of the human story. Uh, this view of reality is then expressed in the theology of meticulous providence, irresistible grace, limited atonement, unconditional election, and the perseverance of the saints. Arminians believe that in structuring reality, God has determined that he will limit his power so that humans at both the individual and corporate level will have the capacity for a degree, not absolute, but a degree of libertarian freedom. This is normally described as synergism, although I don't like the word. This view of reality is expressed in the theology of general providence, resistible grace, unlimited atonement, uh, and a non-deterministic non understanding of election, of which there are several Arminian variations. Calvinists speak of compatibil compatibilistic free will, which essentially means that when faced with a choice, we will always choose what God has ordained that we choose. Arminians speak of libertarian free will, which essentially means that when faced with a choice, we have the ability to make a genuine uh, decision between a number of options. The, uh, the position I will argue is obviously that in structural reality, God has limited his power at both the individual and corporate level, so there is genuine human agency. Um, and here are some of the... Uh, some of the evidence that leads me to that, that supports that conclusion. Number one, uh, statements throughout Scripture which assume that God always extends grace to his people. Uh, it's implied that dis disobedience is a consequence of the abuse of libertarian freedom, not a, a failure on God's part to extend sufficient grace. Uh, for example, in Philippians 2, Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to do, uh, in order to uh, to act in order to fulfill His good purpose. Again, what happens when we don't do the right thing? Is God failing to extend the grace there, or is it an abuse of it, it, it's, it's consequence of of our uh, abuse of, of freedom? There's a wonderful prayer for prevenient enabling grace in one Kings. May the Lord our God be with us. May he never leave us or forsake us. May you turn our hearts to him to walk in obedience to him. Uh, secondly, there are countless moral exhortations in scripture. Again, they assume that God's prevenient grace makes obedience possible. But libertarian freedom makes disobedience possible. 
Within a Calvinist framework, God is the one who ordains the precise pattern of obedience and disobedience that will characterize the life of each believer. Three, scriptural portrayals of God being in relationship with people. Genuine relationship requires genuine freedom. If there is no human, genuine human agency, there is no genuine uh, relationship. Uh, for example, John 15, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away uh, and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. In Scripture, there are countless examples, uh, point four. Uh, in Scripture, there are countless examples of God's people resisting His grace, expressed in sin, and embracing bad theology. God, in turn, is represented as grieving, rebuking, and pleading with His people to repent. This makes sense on the assumption of libertarian freedom. On deterministic assumptions, God ordained that they resist His will, grieves over the sin which he choreographed for them, and knows that they will only repent if he ordains repentance. Uh, for example, in Romans 10, Paul explores several explanations for Israel's unbelief, and concludes that the problem is ultimately Israel's resistance to God's grace. All day long I have held up my hands to a disobedient and obstinate people. Uh, on Calvinist assumptions, God is expressing grief over a situation which he ordained. And Schreiner in his Romans commentary, very upfront and affirming exactly that. Point five, other kinds of material which assume a measure of grace enable libertarian freedom, expressions of God, God's universal salvific will, statements of God's purposes for his people that they glorify him, do good works, love one another, promises of eschatological reward for service, warnings against apostasy, God testing his people, uh, and statements about prayer, to name a few. Okay, moving to another part, my main problems uh, with Calvinism. Uh, number one, in two ways, it contradicts biblical affirmations of God's love and goodness. Calvinism affirms that God predestines people to hell, on the basis of the sins and unbelief which he scripted for them. Two, he ordains and choreographs every expression of evil and sin in human experience, whether committed by a believer or an unbeliever. We are all aware of the unrelenting flood of evil, injustice, and carnage in the world. It's difficult enough to explain why God permits these things, but to argue that God actually ordained and choreographed it all? C.S. Lewis uh, once argued that God's goodness cannot be wholly other. In other words, it can have, it has, there has to be some similarity between our, good, our sense of goodness and, and his goodness. Because if it is, then we have no idea what it means to say, what it means to say that God is good. Mm. It seems to me that Calvinism assumes that God's goodness is wholly other. Uh, what, we, what, would, what would be described as evil, if done by a person, suddenly becomes good if it is done by God. Uh, and the bottom line, I think that Calvinism renders unintelligible the biblical affirmation uh, that God is good. Uh, number two, uh, scriptural affirmations of God's universal uh, love and salvific will. And I'll just give you one of many. Uh, 2 Timothy 2.4, who wants all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. I'll give you a second one. 2 Peter 3.9, <laughs> not wanting any to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. And you know John 3.16, so I don't need to say that. These frequent affirmations, uh, of, uh, of, in my opinion, contradict a theology of the unconditional election of a subset of humanity uh, for salvation. Three, uh, Calvinism, in my opinion, undermines confidence in knowledge. If every human idea and thought has been ordained by God, then obviously God has ordained that most of the time people believe a lot of nonsense. <laughs> Although it seems very reasonable to them at the time. And the question is, how do we distinguish God-ordained nonsense from God-ordained truth? How do we figure it out? If all of our all of our thoughts and ideas uh, are scripted for us. 
Uh, four, it undermines the basis for challenging evil and injustice. Uh, we rightly respond to evil and injustice in society with critiques of various kinds. And Dr. DeCar has some of the finest ones on his Facebook page. Seriously, I'm not joking. Yes. And, uh, but if God is the one who ordains the evil, then why isn't our critique directed against God rather than the people? That's what I always think when I read your stuff. Point five. Point five. God calls us to a higher level of love than he exemplifies. He holds us to a higher standard. People are called to love everyone with precisely the same quality of love. God does not show the same quality of love to the elect, to the non-elect, that he does to the elect. So we, we have to aim higher. Six, it's, I think it's unethical to challenge people to respond to God in a manner which assumes that they have a degree of libertarian freedom, which would enable them to make the right choice and avoid the wrong ones. For example, numerous examples in scripture, but in Deuteronomy 30, see I set before you today life and death, uh, good, uh, life and good, death and evil. If you obey the commandments, you shall live. But if your hearts turn away, I declare to you today, you shall surely perish. The effectiveness of many of these challenges in scripture uh, lies in the fact that they appeal to the assumption that God's people have grace-enabled libertarian freedom. If this is not true, and God is the one who determines all of our choices, then I think it is dishonest and unethical for God to command in a manner that assumes the existence of libertarian freedom. Um, okay, well I'm going to take another minute. <laughs> <laughs> Just keep reading every 30 seconds. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close with two statements from William Blaine Craig, one of the most prominent uh, Christian apologists of our time. As he writes here, on the deterministic view, the whole world has become a vain and empty spectacle. There are no free agents in rebellion against God, whom God seeks to win through his love, and no one who freely responds to that love and freely gives their love and praise to God in return. The whole spectacle is a charade, charade, whose only real actor is God himself. And again, Calvinists like to say that all this is supposed to glorify God. William Lane Craig said it actually denigrates the character of God. Uh, because I'm convinced it denigrates God for engaging in such a farcical charade. It is deeply insulting to God to think that he would create human beings which are in every respect casual, casually determined by him and then treat them as though they were free agents. Uh, punishing them for the wrong, I hear it, for the wrong actions he made them do, or loving them as though they were freely responding agents. And so on, you get the idea there. So, uh, those are most of my objections. <laughs> I feel like I'm the man in the middle. <laughs> that I am. My position is that God is sovereign and permits humanity to ex ex exercise this human freedom within the parameters that he has established. The manner in which human freedom and divine sovereignty operate together in order to accomplish God's will is a mystery and does not fit into the confines of either determinism or libertarianism. I'm going to give seven rem remarks and then I'm going to give about five conclusions. My opening remarks will state how I understand this discussion and what is at stake. To discuss Christian determinism and libertarianism, I must begin with a statement about the method I undertake to deal with the issues raised by these two vantage points. My method of inquiry is to find passages that address these issues. I begin by looking at scripture as my starting point. To attempt to analyze an issue through the lens of a system as the starting point seems to suggest that a doctrinal system is more important than the scriptures themselves. However the systems, whether 
Calvinist or Arminian does focus one's attention on the issues that are to be discussed. My first remarks concern the title of the debate. Are there only two alternatives, determinism and free will? Is there a third alternative that addresses this situation? For me, this seems that these two theological systems force me to choose between the two. Or to put it in another way, do I have to put on a theological lens of Arminius or Calvin and then look at the scriptures? I would rather examine the questions by looking at a passage and then building my arguments from that vantage point. And so I picked one passage I think that speaks of both free will and determinism. And I think it's also, I, and I, it's in the Old Testament, but also as well, the same metaphor is picked up in the New Testament. It's Exodus 4 through 14. And many of you know this passage as a confrontation of Moses against Pharaoh. And in this passage, one sees the will of Pharaoh as he resists the will of the Lord in the context of God's sovereignty. And many of you have had me, and so you know in the passage, 20 times Pharaoh's heart is hardened. 10 times God does it. 10 times Pharaoh does it. And so you have this example of the sovereignty of God and free will as if there is no contradiction. However, at the outset, for God to acknowledge and establish his sovereign, because he is sovereign, he announces what's going to happen beforehand. And so again, for me, the two are seemingly contradictory, but the biblical record posits them as if there is no contradiction. Now, my previous statement uh, leads me to state more clearly the following. Even if one argues for free will in these passages, one sees that, under, that it's under divine sovereignty. Both these passages in Exodus and in Romans 9 through 11 point to the sovereignty and mystery of God. In Exodus, God hardens the heart of Pharaoh. In Romans, a hardening has come upon Israel that will lead to their inclusion. Point five, I do not describe to limited atonement or definite atonement, which is one of the tenets of Calvinism. I believe in universal atonement, not universalism, uh, for the following reasons. And I give a quote here from uh, Christian uh, theology by Erickson. Again, he quotes some of the classic passages, 2 Corinthians 5, 14 through 15, John 3, 16, 1 Timothy uh, 410, which point about the universality of scope, uh, but not the universality of effect. I wonder if God in his foreknowledge uses the terminology as a comfort to us. In two ways, it's a comfort. One, because it exhibits his sovereignty and his foreknowledge of our acceptance of him. It's good for me to know that somebody is in charge. Secondly, it's a comfort to the body of Christ, knowing that the basis of this election is not God's anger, not God's wrath, but God's love for us. Six, there are personalities in the Old Testament, the Exodus event, the conquest of the land of Canaan, that exist as typological examples of how election and free will operate together. One sees the election of individuals in Moses, Abraham, Jacob, Joseph, David, but also one sees the collective election uh, of Israel and the, and the fulfillment of the promises made to Abraham. The examples of the failure of the Old Testament exhibit the dangers of freedom that can be misused. The 12 spies uh, who come back and lie about their report uh, the 603, 550,000, 603,550 uh, soldiers who go along with this report, oh, minus two, go along with this report, then show the danger of not being obedient. And then you pick up some of the same ideas in the New Testament, in the book of Hebrews, where there are warnings for the lack of obedience. Uh, seven, 
God reveals himself in both a transcendent and imminent manner. The names by which Yahweh reveals himself gives us clues into the nature of the Lord. With this being said, one sees both anthropomorphic and anthropopathic language used with respect to God. The idea of Yahweh's presence and participation with us is to be understood by this language. Anthropopathic language of grief and hurt towards human action is only one aspect of God's personality. I think Dr. Sherwood is right. How can God be grieved about something that he knew uh, in his omniscience would happen anyway? That's a theological conundrum. But I think what the anthropomorphic and anthropopathic language suggests to us is that God is imminent in the affairs of humanity. And I also suggest that I think it shows the magnitude of our choices. That even the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords can be grieved, whatever that means. It's finite language of our experience to explain what a transcendent God must feel. And obviously when you're dealing with, with language, there are limitations. Five conclusions. My position is that there is truth in both systems, but the danger of these systems is that it's in my perspective that the scriptures are contorted and twisted to make them fit into the system. My problem with Calvinism is that the doctrine of definite or limited atonement is logical, but it's not biblical. There are too many references to all that speak of the atoning death of Jesus Christ. Even revered Calvinist Roger Nicole has asserted this in his lectures. Uh, Dr. Nicole was a fan of mine, also a fan of uh, Dr. DeCaro, and when we took systematic theology classes at Gordon Combo, he would hand out a list talking about the difference between uh, definite atonement and universal atonement. And what he noticed is that the list of verses that suggested all, the scope of it, far exceeded that of definite atonement. And he acknowledged that, but he didn't change his mind on definite atonement, even though uh, he argued that the evidence wasn't in his favor. <laughs> That's a good job in his wood. It's been foreordained. The problem of evil is a difficult one. For me, Calvin is too glibly put it at the feet of the Lord even though for me there is no other place to put it. In this regard, the complexity and mystery of God works and his purposes for the uh, involved in the issue of mystery can be baffling. Evil is perplexing on a corporate or an individual level, be it the book of Job, Isaiah 45, 7, when God says he does good, tov, and he does Ra -ah, that he does all things. Mm. Or David counting the mighty men at the excitement, at the, ex uh, at the instigation of God. Or African American slavery, or the Holocaust, or, all, or our own personal tragedies. Mm. Sometimes the cold determin determinism of Calvinism makes it sound as if we can just dump it at God's feet and leave it there. Give me two more minutes. <laughs> conversely, conversely, for libertarians, to simply posit evil to humanity and humanity only seems to me to be an affront to God, an abdication of the scriptures, and a lack of stewardship responsibility toward the awesome gift of individual and collective free will under divine authority which the Lord has given us. We misuse our free and then and then uh, we have problems with it and want to throw it to God many of you had me uh, in the Old Testament and after Adam sins standing right there with Eve he says to God this woman you gave to me and then I ate and so uh, the danger I think sometimes with libertarianism is that it points the finger and doesn't look at our own uh, culpability. Fourthly, the scriptures posit for us libertarian freedoms, but I would also again suggest that these freedoms function within 
the confines of divine sovereignty. There's no place to go outside the matrix. Uh, God is in charge and hasn't abdicated that. And then lastly, both determinism and libertarianism can be a threat to the exegesis of scripture. It is my view that they both at places articulate views that are not in keeping with scripture. And they do this in order to make, um, I think, some very valid points uh, fit into their theological system. I'm comfortable with exegeting a passage and let it lay where it is. Mm -hmm. At Gordon Conway, where I was at uh, way back in the day, the theology department and the biblical studies department never got along. The theology department wanted everything to fit in a nice, neat package. But the, the Old Testament department and the New Testament department, they didn't care. They just exegeted the passage and let the truth of the scripture uh, speak for itself. Thank you. Good evening. It's good to be with you and good to be with my beloved brethren and colleagues. Okay, um, I'm looking at this and thinking I'm probably going to get the bell for sure, but let me try. First, uh, I have a first part. Uh, seven assertions in favor of Christian determinism. Uh, and I'm going to skip one because it is perhaps just to say we understand God to be eternal and sovereign. Number two, scripture in both covenants amply reveals that God exercises his sovereignty in both creation and control of his creatures. Libertarian freedom or libertarian free will advocates uh, agree with this. But they insist God's controls are episodic and qualified. Whereas I contend that his meticulous control is, as it were, built into the very DNA of creaturely being. In short, everything that God creates has a created purpose and story. Everything concerning us, not just our physical being or our existence, is written in eternal wisdom. Next, without any tension or anxiety of, about human understanding, Scripture nevertheless holds humans accountable for sin. Not just our sinful actions, but our state of sinful fallenness. Number four, properly speaking, humans are from creation endowed with what I call a creaturely will, not a libertarian free will. I would contend that, first, it is impossible to argue that humans have a free will, that in any way can relate to divine freedom. Since one is original, eternal, and sovereign, and the other is created, temporal, and limited. And this is even prior to the fall in sin, not to mention what happens to the will once we are fallen in sin. In contrast, a creaturely will fits the context of creation itself, although it is not free in absolute eternal terms. Whatever it is that we humans experience as freedom, can only be free in context, since God clearly foreordains, designs, and brings about only what he wills. Simplistic analogies with puppets on strings, etc., as you might hear in some, in some uh, pew kind of uh, arguments, or uh, simply not arguments here. We are made in God's image. We are not toys or tools. But we are image, not original. Our wills reflect his freedom, but cannot be free in a libertarian way. So we experience freedom as creatures. But we are not free as it relates to God's design and purpose. Next, the language of permission when it comes to God is at best an anthropomorphism, an accommodation to limited human understanding. In fact, God ordains everything, good and evil, and, quote, permits nothing that he has not ordained in his eternal purpose. Any attempt to use permission as a hard term by a Christian determinist uh, is really a compromise, and many do. Permission as a hard theological term belongs to the theory of libertarian freedom. Number six, scripture reveals two aspects to God's free will. That which is secret, beyond our knowing and understanding, and that which is revealed by way of his word and its demand upon us. And I'm referring to Deuteronomy 29, 29. God holds us accountable only for his revealed will. That is what, how we respond to or obey his, that revealed will. 
His secret will, and all that it entails, is not accessible to us, nor is it therefore reconcilable to our understanding, and so we ought not to conflate or confuse his secret will with his revealed will, which is for us in the realm of being creatures, or creaturely beings. Next, some theologians, and I'm thinking of J.I. Packer or Martin Lloyd-Jones, referred to this incomprehensible pairing of divine sovereignty and human responsibility as an antinomy, which is defined as a contradiction between two beliefs or conclusions that are in themselves reasonable, or a paradox. I prefer the use of mystery, since the coherence of divine sovereignty and human responsibility are really beyond human comprehension and may never be accessible to us, not, not even in our glorified resurrected state. The Christian believer accepts this inexplicable co coherence by instinct of the Holy Spirit, which is why even self-declared Arminians pray for the salvation of souls. This heart orthodoxy is further exemplified in praying as Jesus taught us, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We all comfort ourselves when God's sovereignty is needed to counteract besetting sorrows. And there is no apparent offense, page turn, in meticulous determination when it works toward our good. It's only when one's free choice is called into question that standard Arminians complain. Uh, the second part, seven reasons why I prefer Christian determinism. <laughs> Number one, the argument I call the argument from plain reading of Scripture. I'm sure that my colleagues obviously disagree. So maybe there's just something, or maybe I have those Calvinist glasses on. <laughs> but as I read, divine determinism is not a contrivance or an imposition upon Scripture. And all Christians believe that it is plainly evident in Scripture, although again, differences occur about the extent of determination. Since Scripture clearly shows divine determinism in both narrative and doctrinal text, then it's reasonable to assume divine determinism as a default reading. That is, it's perfectly reasonable to argue that divine determinism is pervasive, constant, and meticulous, and scripture is filled with examples that pertain to grand and minor details where God exercises such determinism. Number two, what I would call this, the argument of silence in scripture. In contrast, there is no clear theological teaching about libertarian freedom. It is entirely a product of presupposition and inference. Now, admittedly, silence alone does not disprove it, disprove it. Nor does the absence of technical terms in Scripture. For instance, you won't find libertarian free will in the Bible. But that doesn't mean that, that it's wrong in itself. Um, after all, uh, I should say, also, there is, uh, there is no uh, obvious Scriptures that mitigate terms like predestination. But along with positive arguments for meticulous divine determinism, the silence of scripture seems weighty to me, since advocates of liberty and freedom treat it as foundational. Now, just to give you an example, there is no Trinitarian terminology, but I don't object to that being true. Because in my opinion, the Bible is full of ample biblical and theological content that clearly teaches the Trinity. In other words, the scriptures positively assert that. I'm not at all convinced that the scriptures so positively assert libertarian freedom as a doctrine. Number three, the argument from church history, which is simply that in the case of Augustine at the culmination of the ancient church period, as well as the Protestant reformers who essentially represent the end of medieval Roman Catholicism, uh, there was a deeper exegetical and theological approach to reading scripture that resulted in formal Christian determinist teaching. The move away from free will teaching in the church toward Christian determinism make it at least the normative position of Protestant historical theology, despite the preponderance of so-called Arminianism in the last two centuries. Furthermore, while there is an undoubted distinction between the heresy of Pelagianism and so-called Arminianism, I would say they're kind of first cousins. <laughs> in that they share a strong genetic inclination to attack meticulous divine sovereignty, or de excuse me, determinism. Uh, the argument of an unlikely origin is my next, is the belief in the freedom of human will is not uncommon, whereas the composition of a notion that negates libertarian will without satisfying the human mind 
with an explanation uh, must either be the product of madness or divine inspiration. Mm. I argue that it's the latter, and that the absolute de divine determinism is the teaching of heaven regarding the king of heaven and earth. That it cannot be explained to the satisfaction of saints or sinners does not disprove it. Indeed, we see scripture rebuking man for presuming to evaluate what is eternal and sovereign. Romans 9.20 the gospel argument, like so-called Calvinists, the so-called Arminians, experientially and personally advocates salvation by grace through faith in Christ alone. However, on paper, the consistent argument for libertarian free will has troubling, if not hazardous, implications for this most precious doctrine. Why? If salvation is not actuated without the free will acceptance of the believer, then this at least leans away from pure sovereign grace and towards salvation by faith plus works. While evangelical libertarian free will advocates would not accept this analysis, it's even hard for me, who love Arminians, to defend them in this regard. <laughs> Some of my best friends are Arminians. <laughs> oh, okay, there's the bell. Let me just uh, borrow some Arminian minutes. <laughs> The Calvinist ones are brutal, so we're going to do that. Number six, the argument from salvific potentiality, not accomplishment. The libertarian free will assumes that Christ's death provides salvation to, for all and for all who accept him. Uh, I'm scripting this. This is Calvinist. This means that without libertarian freedom, the work of Christ remains potential. The saving work of Christ is potential until or unless people accept it. And it cannot be said to be a finished work, as it is according to the Reformed or Christian determinist view. In fact, in the former scheme, Christ's work really doesn't have any impact at all unless it's authenticated by people. And lastly, the argument from the ultimate inadequacy of divine love, that is the so-called Armin thank you. The so-called Arminian argues that God loves everyone literally and wants everyone to be saved. But in the name of libertarian freedom, he lets many go to hell and suffer eternal judgment. To the contrary, in scripture, it does not appear to me that God ever abandons those he loves. Worse, the universal comprehensive love notion is mitigated by God's unwillingness to save those he purportedly loves in hell. So the Arminian notion of God's comprehensive universal love befits really universalism. In other words, if God really loves everyone, then the logical reading would be that God ultimately will take everyone from hell. I'm just going to, I had final assertions, but I'm just going to close with the last one. And that is, I acknowledge that no system of theology is perfect. And both major views have challenges. However, I would rather myself err on the side of consistent Christian determinism, if only because it is obsessed with divine sovereignty, while so-called Arminianism seems to me fixated on defending God from human accusations of injustice. And with all due respect, I frankly do not care if people, believers or not, think God is just. Scripture teaches and declares that God is just, regardless of man's uh, ability or inability to understand his ways in time or eternity. And Paul says in Romans 11 that we cannot fathom his ways and know his, his path. So um, I believe I present that. Thank you.